Beautiful. The Visiting Artist Program, funded by PATHA's graduate program, brings an outstanding roster of local, national, and international artists to PATHA each semester for lectures, critiques, and workshops. The program exposes students and the public to a range of artistic approaches and fosters discussion about contemporary art and ideas. This afternoon, we are pleased to have Jason and Leslie of JULM Studios joining us. JULM Studios is a collaboration between Jason Urban and Leslie Mutchler. Working in Brooklyn, their work is project-based and research intensive. They employ an art practice of pseudo-bibliology through the study of books, printing, and publishing. Their projects investigate the evolving meaning of printed matter and the sacred spaces that print occupies, always aware of the dialogue between analog and digital technologies in our day to day. The pair has had solo exhibitions at NARS Foundation in Brooklyn, New York, Grizzly Grizzly in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the Print Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the Center for Fine Print Research in Bristol, UK, Space Gallery in Portland, Maine, Atelier Circulaire in Montreal, Canada, among others. They have been awarded numerous residencies, including Edition Basel in Basel, Switzerland, Cork Printmakers International Visiting Artist Residency in Cork, Ireland, and are currently in residence at the year-long Dudenay Papermaking Workspace Residency in Brooklyn. Both are affiliated with Pratt Institute, where Mutchler is the chair of the foundation program, and Urban teaches publishing courses in the communication design program. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Jason and Leslie. You may now begin sharing your screen. Thank you very much, Jill. Okay, so we're very happy to be here and, and we're gonna get started. Um, so thanks Jill and um, Jen and Nicole um, from the Visiting Artist um, Program at PAFA. We're excited to be here. Um, thank you to the people that we see in the audience that you know we know from other places. We're very happy you could also join us. Um, so we're really looking forward to meeting with students after our lecture. Um, today, we'll be sharing a series of projects um, from the last few years to illustrate our research and making practice, as well as our collaborative way of working. Because we work in an iterative way where the various bodies of work get repurposed and recycled through multiple exhibitions, um, our presentation isn't necessarily in chronological order. So I'm gonna get us started. And thank you again for having us. Jorge Luis Borges was a prolific Argentinian writer from the last century whose themes included identity, free will, and the nature of reality. His story, The Library of Babel, describes a near infinite maze-like library filled with every variation of a 410 page book. Though the order and content of the books throughout the library is random and apparently meaningless, the inhabitants of the library believe that the books contain every possible ordering of the 25 basic characters. That's 22 letters, the period, the comma, and the space. Though the vast majority of the books in this universe are incoherent nonsense, the library must also contain somewhere every coherent book ever written or that might ever be written and every possible permutation or slightly erroneous version of every one of those books. To restate, the library contains every possible version of every possible book. Knowing this, the narrator of the story explains the library contains all useful information, including predictions of the future, bibliographies of any person, and translations of every book in all languages. The Library of Babel was published in 1941, but reading it now in 2020, the story seems like a prediction of the information age, a time when all information is available online, if only we could find it. So Borges borrowed the name of the library from the biblical story of the Tower of Babel. And so this Old Testament narrative takes place in an unlikely proto-historical time when all people on earth spoke the same language. Together, the people decided um, to build a tower to reach heaven, or at least that's how the story goes. When they got close, God struck them down. Not only did God prevent the humans from completing the tower, but God scattered them across the world and caused them to speak 
different languages so they couldn't communicate and work together, um, hindering future attempts to reach heaven. So like the tower, the library alludes to an unreachable goal, omniscience or knowing of all things. On a philosophical level, we think the Borges story is a good place to start a lecture about our work because it illuminates humanity's futile impulse to know the unknowable. As artists, we are committed to inquiry. Simply put, projects can give curiosity, curiosity and questions. questions. Whether those questions get answered in our work is not so much the point as is the search for answers. Babylon Bound is the first iteration of a body of work that we started together in 2017, based on the library as a curated and performed space. In many ways, the library is a perfect intersection of our interests. It's the site of possibility, research, experimentation, and collaboration. It's fueled by print as a conduit for information. We are both printmakers by training. We have multiple degrees in printmaking between us, but we define print expansively. We emphasize the multiple nature of print and often incorporate photos, video, and sculptural works into our installations. Print often exists, exists in our work through elements of pseudo-bibliography, which is the study of books, printing, and publishing. We began Babel Unbound by researching the library as a cultural institution, looking for clues in historical and contemporary texts by a range of authors. And we then turned that research into the content of the show, an endless book, if you will. We generated a series of print, printed works, risographs, Xeroxes, and screen prints that aspire to be a publication, but are instead pulled apart ephemeral and in flux, lining the walls of the gallery space. So like, like Borges Library, the page spreads are random in order and involve numerous iterations of slightly altered content. Photographs, 3D printed objects, and large scale digital prints break up the monotony of displayed publication and help to loosely connect by thread, by memory, by mark, pieces of text, repaginated essays, screen captured images and scans of book spreads. The gallery becomes a circular space without hierarchy with no beginning and no end. A confused noise made by a number of voices. Libraries are a quick window into a place, a country, a city, an institution or a person. When we visit a friend or colleague's home or office, we often scan their shelves to take stock of what they read, which no doubt tells us who they are, what they believe and how they arrange. As artists, we've spent countless hours in print shops and studios, but as the public, we've collectively spent many more hours in the libraries. We might note that it wasn't until people began to publish books that our collective sense of ourselves as the public began to take shape. There are many sources of inspiration that provide insight as to how libraries do and perhaps should function as curated spaces beyond their often functional goals. From Abby Warburg's oval-shaped denkrum, or space of thought that was erected in 1933, to the modern day Prelinger Library, many thinkers and practitioners have attempted to reinvent our approach to organizing information. Anna Sophia Springer, author of Melancholies of the Paginated Mind, The Library as Curatorial Space, explains, quote, if the book is traditionally seen as the preferred medium for private consumption and research, and the gallery is understood as the space for public exhibition and performance, the library as public place of reading is thus a hybrid site for performing the book. Sorry, sorry about that. Megan Prelinger, one of the co-founders of the Prelinger Library in San Francisco, California, states that many of the holdings of her library did not really fit the taxonomic systems of either the Library of Congress or the Dewey Decimal. So instead, she utilizes a geospatial taxonomy to arrange and order the holdings. Quote, on the main shelves of the library, the arrangement system classifies subjects spatially and conceptually 
beginning with the physical world and moving into representations of culture and ending with abstractions on society and theory. It can be summarized as a walk through a landscape of ideas from feet on the ground to outer space. Within the framework, there are dozens of associative links between subject sections from site specific to mediated to abstract, from particular to general and from micro to macro, end quote. Referencing a series of historical works, Babel Unbound is intertwined with the function and performance of the library. Abby Warburg's Atlas Monocony, Jorge Luis Borges's The Library of Babel, and Walter Benjamin's Unpacking My Library help us to contemplate the library of today, one that's filtered through reproducibility, access to information, and an ever-evolving understanding of curation, aesthetics, and the archive. The library is a fertile place for exploration, a place that most often prioritizes use over display, whereas the gallery is a site that prioritizes display over functionality. Babel Unbound attempts to do both, and while doing so, slowly becomes aware of itself as a legible, complicated, and incomplete. In the third and final installation, we incorporated a kind of minimalist compass rose seen in this slide pointing the viewer toward north, south, east, and west. As Prelinger states, quote, the process of research is inseparable from the physical process of exploration in this world. In my experience, creative and intellectual work flows from physical engagement with the landscape. The process of walking, hiking, or taking a road trip are all useful activities for developing new ideas, end quote. As we adapted the work to new spaces, we began to see the walls of the gallery as pages, so we layered them with final text. Didactics and clues allow the viewer to experience an archive of research and conjecture. The various images we've just shown you are a scattered sampling of three different shows that have evolved all from the same line of inquiry. So Babel and Bound was accompanied by a single channel video called Performing the Book, which explores both the tactile handling of loose pages while bound and references the magenta fingered scanning process at Google Books Library Project. Google employs thousands of magenta glove data entry workers who manually flip pages for scanning. On rare occurrences, their fingers elude detection and make it into the online versions of scanned books. Framed poetically, these digital traces of analog labor haunt the literature they serve. They remind us of the humans that maintain the internet and generate the seemingly endless content. With the book in motion, relationships emerge and dissipate within seconds, making the magic of browsing visible and highly aesthetic. Turning the pages of a book serves a function data access, but it also can be a symbolic performed activity. New information is revealed as old information disappears. As information consumption is increasingly experienced through digital conduits, what does the antiquated action of turning pages mean? As you've gathered by now, we are collaborators. Initially, we shared a studio to pursue our own individual works, but over time, as we exchanged more and more feedback, we found common ground and began to work together exclusively. From ideation to execution, we share in all aspects of our practice. We are equal partners in our work and in our life, and in some ways consider our partnership a political act that we are modeling a co-equal approach to authorship. Our, compliments, our accomplishments are always shared. While practical, as we mentioned maybe earlier, we do have an eight-year-old son and we have jobs that of course take us away from our studio. Working collaboratively has allowed us to double the effort and energy for any given project, 
which has resulted in more ambitious and intensive goals. We share physical but also intellectual labor and enjoy a fruitful dialogue when working together. Most artists have inner dialogue when they work in their studio, but as collaborators, we get to share an outer dialogue. We talk, we ask questions, and we share with one another constantly. So we've been working together in some way or another for years, shared print shops, shared studio spaces, shared students and colleagues, um, and even a marriage. We have been each other's sounding boards, critics and supporters since we met in 2004 in Philadelphia, actually. Prior to that, we both chose educational institutions and programs to align ourselves with that would support and challenge us. And in large part, that decision-making was dependent on the communities that we found in those places. Leslie's solo practice often utilized community participation, and I spent eight years collaborating with Amzie Emmons and R.L. Tillman on the award-winning website, Printeresting. Counter to the artist as loner and, reclu and, reclus and reclusive uh, narrative, um, we are predisposed toward collaboration. In addition to being artists, we are also, and importantly, teachers, and thus we situ situate ourselves in the gray space between art, design, and craft. As educators, one of the first phrases we introduce our students to is the pursuit of knowledge. It's a lofty phrase, but it, was at, but it is at the core of what artists do. Many of our students believe that common misconception reinforced by myth and popular culture that inspiration strikes like a lightning bolt. An inexplicable creative force delivers fully formed ideas from above to the fortunate few. While inspiration and talent for that matter are not irrelevant, we believe that work and information lead to ideas. Pick a subject, begin an investigation, and this will lead to something new. Our 2019 exhibition at Lock Haven University entitled Gray Mists Between Us featured another body of work that investigates color, print, and collective memory. For this project, we began collecting images of social unrest from old time and life magazines from the 1960s and the 1970s. The images were then cropped and edited to remove figures and other visual anchors so that gray images of residual protest and violence could contrast to our paper, a subdued primary palette of pink, yellow, and light cyan paper. The installation of layered digital prints evoking the smoking and obscured remnants of a civil strife and political tumult at once too familiar and yet distant. The large scale, large scale abstracted images printed on everyday office grade bond paper suggests the ephemerality and fragility of any one generation's defining moments. It may also evoke bureaucratic processing of revolt. Of Strange Shadows, the first iteration of this work was much brighter and more colorful. The images were crisp, clear, and legible with foreboding scenes of fire, haze, and smoke. The title of the exhibition was taken from American poet, Anthony Hex, 1977 book of poetry, Millions of Strange Shadows, which wrestles with some of the tragedies of the 20th century. In turn, Hex's choice of title was referencing Shakespeare's 53rd sonnet, which speaks to an attempt at intergenerational understanding. Working through iteration allows us to develop and explore possibilities. The work is research. Because the work is research, we consciously change things from installation to installation in hopes of finding new and perhaps better solutions. Phantom Shapes and Ghost Events was the second version of this work, and it was shown at the Center for Fine Print Research at the University of West England in Bristol, England. Between exhibitions, we overprinted the images to gray out the color, burying the imagery under layers of text, amplified halftones, and more gray scales. To continue the illusion of poetry, we added excerpts from Spectra, a book of poetic experiments published in 1916 by Witter Bit. Binner and Arthur Davison Fick under the pseudonyms Emmanuel Morgan and Anne Knish. Spectra is a book of poetry built on the language of color, but more interestingly, it was intended by Banner and Fick as a satirical response to the imagism poetry movement, which they felt lacked substance. Spectra poems were written as a hoax, 
attempting to make fun of the imagist's vibrant and nonsensical approach to writing poetry. But ironically, their spectra poems became far more important to the history of poetry than anything the poets wrote with sincerity. As artists, we felt this footnote from literary history was a way to inject the ever presence of misinformation and misunderstanding into our image-based work. For us, these prints represent the haze of time as we try to understand our era through the memories of another generation. The closer we might get to understanding, the grayer and more confusing that space becomes. There was a time not so long ago when the newspaper, traditional printed media, was seen as a representation, <clears throat> a representation of the truth, hence saying that something is black and white. But the reality is that truth is slippery. It always has been. With endless information at our fingertips, truth collides and blurs to become a middle gray, something complicated and dense and hard to see. The presence of light in the form of EL wire, the neon which appears in the second and third iteration of the series, speaks to a searching for and a struggle to come out of that gray space, out of those gray shadows and into a space of illumination. Someone akin to building a tower to reach heaven or a library that might contain all of the world's knowledge, the light is a beacon and a guide. To quote the poetry of Anthony Hecht, quote, some shadowless, unfocused light, all things coming into their own right, end quote. During the winter of 2019, we exhibited Long Lost Friend at the Print Center in Philadelphia. Long Lost Friend is a totemic archive of folk magic inspired matter. Approximated and inauthentic, various images and 3D scans of talismans and charms suggest a world of superstition removed from tradition, an aestheticized staging situated between boutique and library with references to both the past and the future. Long Lost Friend is a reflection on the mystical and a longing for tangible tangible belief systems. The exhibition title comes from the 19th century Book of Spells and Home Remedies, Powwows or Long Lost Friend by John George Homan. The book addresses a range of superstitions regarding marriage and birth and day-to-day -day social interactions, but also includes cures for illness and cattle and other practical information that would have concerned the farming community for whom the book was written. The exhibition revolves around an archive of found and crafted objects, all approximating meaningful totems. We used photography to document the objects on various green and orange backgrounds, isolating them from the real world to imbue them with a sense of importance. We used print on demand services to make magazines or catalogs and then documented those as well. The image on the right is an example of a documented magazine page. All told, there were more than 500 images in our archive. While some objects occur more than once, the library of images continues to grow. This database is generative fodder to be explored in myriad ways. The overly saturated images of natural and handmade talismans began to build a strange anthropological collection that occupies a uh, occupied a space in the gallery alongside the real and the virtual. Wallpaper, me wallpaper merges traditional cross-stitch patterns with 3D photogrammetry scanning grids and serves as a backdrop for pseudo-anthropological images printed on aluminum and tabloid page spreads. CNC routed plywood provides a framework for display referencing shaker style utility. Sourcing various historic texts, we have interwoven symbols and ruins to arrive at something both of the rational world yet outside of it. Often our shows are accompanied by books or bibliographies as we feel compelled to share our research and our process in formats that are more accessible and manageable. In the fall of 2018, Lucky Rezograph invited us to do a residency. Because we were deep in production mode for Long Lost Friend, we decided to produce a publication in conjunction with the show. The book, Water Worn Bricks, Pie Stones, Chalk Rocks and Smudge Sticks, 
was printed over the course of a few months in residence at Lucky Risograph and is essentially a handheld exhibition of the archive. As opposed to the print on demand magazines we made in earlier exhibitions, this was made as a standalone object. It was intended to function as a field guide of sorts, cataloging some objects, but it also included graph paper for possible notes and marginalia. You may be noticing an increase in the saturation of color as we bring you close to our most current work. In the summer of 2018, we moved from Austin, Texas, where we were both faculty at UT's Department of Art and Art History for 10 years to Brooklyn, New York, so that I could take a position as chair of foundation at Pratt Institute. Before leaving Austin, I had been developing a course with a colleague called The New Color. I've been able to continue this curricular research at the, in the, within the Pratt Department, Pratt, Pratt Foundation Department, in conjunction with long, a longstanding course titled Light Color and Design, which is a critical opportunity for students, first year students, to learn color usage and strategies grounded in aesthetics, but also scientific understanding and cultural context. Inspired by these serendipitous encounters with color and education, we became aware that color was shifting from a supporting to a leading role in our studio practice. Our exhibitions were increasingly reliant on color, so why not embrace this shift and give it, a more, and give it more concentrated attention? We'd come to realize that color had become the subject of our work. With this in mind, we pivoted the focus of some residency opportunities for future research. For example, we were invited to the Center for Fine Print Research at the University of West England in Bristol to mount an exhibition, give a lecture, and work, and work on an experimental print project using interference pigments and silkscreen production. The CFPR has developed relationships with commercial print industry that give artists access to the latest commercial printing technologies. Rather than a traditional, tr traditional subtractive CMYK color space, we were able to explore a kind of analog additive RGB color space. The resulting print, counterintuitive to the way that printers normally work, layers red, blue, and green in a pro and to result in a, in a white. We are continuing to develop this approach today. Another example, we another example, um, we started 2020 with a year-long residency at Dudenay Papermaking Studio in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. While we did experience a multi-month interruption thanks to the pandemic, we are back to work now. Our initial interest in papermaking came from a 2014 a trip abroad to Italy where we were able to visit the historic Fabriano paper mill. We've been eager to explore the possibilities of paper ever since. And we actually began our experiments with papermaking as part of Dudenay's community print shop um, last summer, but then we're awarded the residency this year that includes the help of a master papermaker. On a technical level, we started by learning some basic approaches to sheet forming, pulp painting through stencils and wet collage. Conceptually, we culled through books about color theory, aesthetics, optics, and poetry pairing it with geological photographic images. We worked intuitively at first, building images on wet pulp that merged our various interests in color and geology, inserting bars of linen pulp paint through stencils as a kind of provisional color key. As we, work, as we worked amidst the colored vats of pulp paper and reading texts on color, color theory, and color mysticism, we came to realize that we were generating our work through the lens of academia. We were creating the beginnings of a fictive academic course, which we titled Introduction to Geochromatic Studies. The resulting paperworks combined various rock images that we collected and books that we'd photographed. Our interest in geology started making appearances in the work as we sought to reference the physical origins of pigments and other studio materials and began thinking about time compressed. For example, in 2014, we bought a giant chunk of magnesite on eBay from a guy in Nevada for a show we had in Montreal. Magnesite, you may know as the raw form of magnesium carbonate that's used in lithography. Since then, various natural materials have been creeping into the work.
As we've already mentioned, libraries are a critical source of inspiration for us, providing clues to drive the work forward at various stages. For this project, we arranged a trip to New Haven to visit the world-renowned Barron Collection of Books on Color at the Yale University Library. The collection houses noted sc color scholar Faber Barron's original library and has been supplemented over the years with all manner of books on color. The slide on the right shows Faber Barron himself setting up a color experiment in his book, Color and Human Response. On the left, an image of us working at the Yale Library collection with the book, The Mysticism of Color from 1912, opened on a support cradle. Reading is important to us, of course, but beyond that, sometimes we attempt to learn in a more tactile or more physical way. This is one example of, um, of multiple attempts to bring books to life in our studio through reenactments and restaging. On the left, you can see a contact sheet of attempts to capture the spirit of the image of Baron that we showed you on the previous slide. To use pedagogical language, this is a kind of active learning that we engage in. Here, we can explore the recontextualization of the history of color, a history that we know was largely written by a single class and demographic. As we mentioned earlier, we truly believe that research and iteration leads to ideas. Pick a subject and begin an investigation, and this will lead to something new. What's particularly fascinating to us is that in the arts, research is allowed to be shaky, fallible, and half-baked. Our research doesn't have to amount to anything. It can be a thought muddled or confused, shared or not. Truly, as Joseph Boyce said, quote, even the act of peeling a potato can be a work of art if it is if it is a conscious act, end quote. This January, or this past January, we installed intermediate geochromatic studies at NARS Foundation in Brooklyn. The course, the exhibition, is part of an open-ended inquiry into color and science, pseudoscience, and the spiritual. Large swaths of color akin to color pickers on digital screens were paired with pigmented cotton paper and collage works, as well as risograph prints, photographs, and offset books which sat on a circular plinth in the center of the space. As part of a larger curricular sequence still being built, the class explores both rational and irrational applications of color in the context of historical precedents and speculative interpretation. The circular plinth designed magically to reflect color in the center of the room Taking was designed to magically reflect color in the center of the room, taking on the notion of color aura or an immersive color therapy in a slightly perhaps different direction. Quote, the changing of bodies into light and light into bodies is very comfortable to the course of nature, which seems delighted with transmutations, end quote, wrote Isaac Newton in Optics or a treatise of the reflections, refractions, inflections, and colors of light. We read about a project by our artist Ian Whittlesey conducted in 2017 called Becoming Invisible. Whereas Whittlesey posits that we can become invisible if we can control color around our being. We liked this idea. In his book, it states, quote, these exercises are intended to allow you to become invisible. This does not, however, mean that you will physically disappear or dematerialize. Instead, you will be hidden from view, concealed within a cloud of your own creation. The cloud will be a gently glowing agglomeration of the white light that surrounds you completely. Like the sun or a bare bulb, it will be visible but unobservable, repelling the gaze of anyone who looks directly at it." End quote. So Whittlesey is borrowing from the philosophy of Mazdaznan here. Mazdaznan was a cultish spiritual practice that stemmed from the writings of Dr. Ottoman Tsar Adusht Hanish in the 1960s. Interestingly, Johann Itten, one of the pioneers of color theory at the Bauhaus, became, became a follower of Mazdaznan. As perhaps another form of transcendental exercise, upon the plinth sits a geochromatic library, a collection of books pairing the language of geological matter to the language of color codes. 
These books aren't meant to be read like a typical book, but instead are an investigation into the graphic qualities of letter and number forms and an exploration into the way in which hex code, when read or spoken aloud over and over, could possibly, through meditative practice, transport us to another dimension, the dimension of color space. And as we end our presentation, we'd like to share with you a bibliography. So that'll get posted in the chat here shortly. Typically in all of our exhibitions, we share resources with the audience as a way to introduce them to the same content that we've digested as we've made our work. Perhaps you will find something very different in the texts or perhaps you will come to similar conclusions, but it's up to you to investigate and to find out. In this way of working, it allows um, for our, each exhibition and each body of work to become its own mini class in a sense, a special topics course with a reading list and room for discussion. So with that, we wanna thank you for having us today and thank you for listening and we look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for that awesome presentation. Um, I copy and pasted that link to the bibliography, so anybody is free to take a look at that. Um, I'm going to wait for some questions to come in um, from the audience. If you have a question, just feel free to type it in the chat. Um, I think something for me that I'm super curious about is that we don't often hear from artist duos or collaborators. Um, so if maybe you could speak to like the nitty gritty, like how the work gets split up, if there's like a difference in who does what, um, just like kind of how that functions as being a partnership. Okay, I'll take it first since Jason didn't jump in there. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's what everybody always wants to know, the nitty gritty of that. How is it that two people can work together, especially two people that share a house and a marriage and a child? Sometimes um, it's asked very skeptically. <laughs> Um, I, you know, it, each project is different. So each project, um, you know, we kind of, we, we work really very much the way that we work and have been working for several years is really very project based, right? We're looking um, at a, a project for a specific gallery, a space, um, a residency that we're working on. And so we, we know, you know, we start by looking at the space. What are the goals? What are the outcomes? What's who's the audience? Um, you know, are because we're together constantly, uh, we're constantly talking about our work. So it's almost as if we never have to start a new conversation into a new body of work. It just sort of evolves naturally from day to day, week to meet, week, month to month, year to year. Um, and I think, you know, you can see that thread in the work occasionally where it just kind of keeps moving and you see things that get reused or get repurposed or we rethink, right, over and over again. In terms of like sharing physical work with one another, I think, you know, I might work on something for a while and then I pass it off to Jason or Jason might work on something and then pass it back to me. Um, but a lot of what we do anymore is, um, you know, it's kind of back and forth. We each play editor, but then a lot of the work is, um, I would say professionally, I'm looking over there because Jason's actually over there now. Um, and it's weird not to look at him when I'm talking. Um, Zoom, pandemic, such a weird world we're in. Uh, a lot of the work is now at this point professionally fabricated. So uh, we get a lot of it set up and then we send it out to fabricators to help us with. Um, yet, you know, some of the work is still very physical and in our hands. And, you know, we sit at the kitchen table and make little objects or totems out of Sculpey at night, or um, Jason goes over to Pratt and CNC's some wood and paints it in our basement. And, you know, yeah, it's, not, it's, it's we, a, we let go of our studio because we got this amazing one year residency at Dudenay, which is just a mile away. And we were like, well, we're going to be spending time there. And, um, you know, lo and behold, like a pandemic strikes and we're sort of trapped in this really small, like 700 square foot apartment with our son in terms of production. It's been a challenge, but we've definitely, I think in terms of the, like the nitty gritty about it, like we're like really like, we're not like, we're, it's very much co-equal. Like, so we said it in the talk and it's true. Like, I think ideas go back and forth. I, we have both suggested things to each other that like get complete thumbs down right away. 
we have both like made suggestions that like then we build like so it just it kind of you know it's very much a back and forth it's very equal fabrication i mean there's certain things like like most of the time if it if it if wood's involved like i feel like i'm usually the one using the power tools on the wood but like and leslie's like a master of like exacto blade you know i don't know I don't, I don't know what the right right uh, word for that would be, but like, I mean, she's got like craft skills unparalleled, but um, I think, yeah, I just, I think it's really even, it sort of depends on the project and it just is like, whatever makes the most sense, who has more time right now to dedicate to the thing? Perfect, thank you. <laughs> um, we have a quick question from Christy, who's asking for obscure color theory book recommendations. I don't know if any of those exist in the bibliography, or maybe you they, could they are exclusive. there. Yeah. Yeah, that was, yeah. Thank you. I was um, when I that was a thank you for the bibliography because that was what I wanted. <laughs> so I appreciate that very much. Perfect. Perfect. We were at a talk not too long ago, and uh, the artist that spoke at the end popped. Someone said, "Do you have any book recommendations?" And she popped up her bibliography, and we're like. Yes, this why is the perfect. Why we are already, we? What? We already make bibliographies. Yeah. Why are we sharing them like in, in this kind of world? So uh, happy to share. Happy to share. Enjoy. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Um, so um, we have a question from Jen. She asks if you could explain more about the arrival to make the translucent pigments, I think the interference pigments that you were talking about. Um, if you could return to that slide and describe it, it blew my mind. Uh, seeing it on the black paper. Are you working with chemists or other color theorists? Any elaboration would be awesome. Yeah, so, um, I mean, the science is actually, I would say, kind of beyond us. Um, okay. So, I mean, I feel like we're, we're getting a handle on how it works and how to get decent results. Um, one of the reasons why it hasn't been exhibited yet is because we haven't done anything that we're super like proud of in the context of art. Um, but we've had, um, we basically, this was all done in, in the UK where they had already sort of formulated their own, um, you know, like kind of like, well, here's the ratio of silkscreen binder or like, you know, like um, material to the pigment, right? Because you're mixing in this raw pigment. And so we've been able to track down um, not exactly the same brand of pigment. And again, this isn't like pigment that's being marketed to screen printers or anything. It's like pigment that exists for like cool, I don't know, like rave flyers or something. Like it's not, it's, it's like for a different, whole different audience. Um, but we've been able to find something that works really pretty similarly here in the States. Um, and it's, we've been sort of playing with formulas for the silkscreen part of it, getting like results that we're happy with. Um, there's also like a whole other like set of obstacles in terms, you know, like in a normal CMYK process, your output for burning screens, like your films have to be kind of particular. And so we're sort of working with that. We got so far with CFPR, um, we were supposed to go back there this summer. And then again, like not to keep like, you know, blaming the pandemic. I feel like we're very fortunate that, that we're in as good a position as we're in, but certainly there were interruptions to our practice. So we, we had, um, we received the grant to go back to England to work on this project with the team that we'd started it with. And um, since then we've been sort of left on our, to our own devices and sort of, we have a communication lines are open with them and there's like fingers crossed that at some point we'll get back. But in the meantime, we're kind of like experimenting on our own with what we have. I don't, I don't know if that really answers your question. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really like, it's like a mind blowing thing to see it in person. These, these images don't really do it justice actually. Gotcha. Um, we have another question. Um, I enjoy it from Milan. I enjoy your work. It's thorough and I appreciate that. I'm curious about how your experience entering and gaining traction in the art world with such a specific and unique practice. Was it more or less difficult to get work out that was less traditional? than I guess, typical gallery work? Um, I mean, I think it's, isn't it kind of a struggle for everyone, like regardless, like whatever you're doing? I mean, I think even, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I think we're still at a place like where we're at, like we still, like sometimes people invite us to do things, but we still apply to some things. And, 
you know, like, I feel like even now at like whatever age we're at and however long we've been doing this, it's not like everything comes up in our favor every time. Um, so I think I, at this point, like we're not commercial gallery artists. So like, if that's like, we don't kind of, we're not on that track. Like we make our living through academia and then we pursue ideas that are of interest to us. We pursue opportunities that are of interest to us. And like just looking for chances to share like what we're interested in, in like a reasonable way. Um, I mean, people, people who talk to us tend to like what we do. I think if they didn't, they probably wouldn't talk to us. So um, I don't know. I think, I think what Jason just said about um, recognizing that we're not gallery artists, like that's super important. Um, I think we recognized very early on in our own individual practices, at least I did, that there was, I had no hope of, or chance, or even real want of being a commercial gallery artist. Like it's just wasn't something I wanted. I've always been really comfortable in a classroom. I like being part of an academic institution. That was, for me, that all felt very comfortable and felt normal. And then it gave me and then later us the freedom to pursue any sort of crazy idea that we wanted to. And also, you know, as you're all learning as students and will learn as you continue on in academia, you'll find support there for um, doing things as well. You know. Um, whether it be financial support or just you know networking and ways to connect with people and get gain access to resources and studios and labs, um, it it just it works for us that way. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing is we've gotten way more grants than have sold work. <laughs> like if you were to compare those like spreadsheets, like the one is a very small small spreadsheet, um, and I think um, I think that's probably our own fault. Like we haven't focused on the idea of like working through commercial galleries for sales. But I think, again, it gives us a freedom to change what we're doing, to do what we want. I mean, we can work with archival materials, but we don't have to work with archival materials. Um, you know, so it's, it's, um, and that's, that's important for us. Gotcha. Yeah, that definitely explains like there's so many benefits to not working with the gallery as much as there are a lot of benefits to working with the gallery. And it seems like with your work, it kind of makes sense not to even bother. <laughs> um, so we have a question about- but Just what? to be clear, like we wouldn't totally object to the possibility of selling things. It just isn't like where we put our energy. Right, right. I think um, not in every case, but I think that whole layer on like an artistic practice can kind of change things in a weird way. I mean, I don't know if you would think about it in that way, but at least um, I think the whole layer of like the the market <laughs> can kind of skew things in a way that like you wouldn't expect going into it. But I'm not with a gallery, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> um, so we have a question about books from Sarah. Uh, she asks, I recently picked up George Perec's brief notes on the art and manner of arranging one's books. And of course, on Zoom, our bookcases have become a familiar backdrop to us all. I was wondering if you might talk about how either of you arrange your personal libraries. That's a fun question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it changes all the time. Uh, it it, it, actually, our books move around a lot. They move around a lot. Yeah, I, I mean, it, you know, we've done all of the different sort of aesthetic different arrangements from color, color arrangements to size to, you know, Perfect. yeah. But I, I think, you know, what we've kind of landed on the last couple of years in terms of our own personal library is really this like interest in um, something that, you know, like, art historian, crazy art historian, Abby Warburg was experimenting with, which was like this idea that the library is constantly changing and that the organization of the books should change based on, you know, whoever kind of comes into the spaces and decides to rearrange things or put things wherever they think it should, like, should go. But this idea of like flexibility and flux and constant change seems really to me, and I think to Jason as well, like really pertinent to the way that a library should function um, because it is so, I mean, you know, we've, 
we've all spent time in libraries. Library is so much about browsing, right? You walk into a space, you're looking for one thing, you end up finding five other things that are, you know, way more amazing than you could have even imagined. Um, and so, you know, I think the arrangement of those things and the placement of those things and um, the happenstance of finding them is super important. And so in our own collection, that stuff moves around all the time, all the time. Yeah. There's a, I don't know if any of you have ever like um, heard anyone from um, uh, Hatch Show Print talk about their wood type collection, but they talk about it being like a living collection that like it, it's through using it that it's relevant and it's the thing that keeps it alive. Like if, if you just let it sit and like sort of like it'll dry, the, the wood will, will dry out and sort of crack and, you know, it's because they're using it that it's, it continues to exist. And I think like in terms of libraries or, you know, the library, I mean, we're, are, it's like a living collection of things. And I also think it might be worth pointing out that like, we're not overly sentimental about the books either. So I feel like our, we probably get rid of more books than, and we don't have as many books as like someone might think for people who talk about the importance of a library. Like we, we like call the collection regularly. Like you to bring a book in, maybe you should take a book out, you know, because we have a limited space and, um, and it just kind of, yeah, they, they move around a lot. It's, it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, our son has like a ton of books and I feel like I arrange them differently than Leslie arranges them and he rolls his eyes at both of us. So I think um, it's, it's like a fun project that goes on in the background all the time. And we should, I should make Jason talk a little bit too about our um, artist book collection because we do have, while, while we don't have a huge library of book books, we have a enormous, I think, collection of artist books, Jason. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it, I'm, I'm, I guess when I say we're not sentimental, right? I, I, so like, if you see that giant cabinet right up there, like it's, there's, you know, like half of it is full of like bins of um, various zines and books and things. So um, yeah, I don't need to add anything to that, but <laughs> layers upon layers of collection, right? Yeah, I guess I'm on the heels of that. Speaking of things always being in flux, um, Nicole has a question. Uh, with your iterative approach, do you ever feel a piece or body of work is ever complete or finished? Or are your works always open to being reworked and rearranged? I'm gonna jump in. I think like nothing's nothing static. Um, well, I mean, like in the occasion, on the rare occasion that um, like if we if we um, something is sold or we give something away, I guess kind of at that point it's like out of our hands. But the things that stay with us, I mean, we're constantly cutting things down or like changing things and. You know, a lot of our practice evolved out of being in Texas for 10 years. And like, we had to make things that were portable and packable and shippable. Um, but then that turned into sort of like, it kind of became ingrained in a way. So I think um, like, we think in a way that like, how can things be packed and sort of like broken down? And I think when we finish a show, it's like, okay, well, if we're gonna have to store this, like, what does that mean? And, and is it is it useful to us in this form or would it be more useful for the next show if we like changed it? So, I mean, when, when we took down the show in uh, that show in Lock Haven, which was the third iteration of that, those big gray vertical pieces, um, we literally set up a station for the students who were helping us um, take it down. They were literally cutting it all, all those giant sheets down to the same size and, and, and folding them for us so that like we have this giant stack now of like smaller sheets that look kind of like broadsides like newspapers. And we haven't exhibited that yet or done, like, I mean, the idea is to do something with it again. Um, so like, even as it's like leaving the gallery, it's getting processed into something different without us even knowing what or where it's going. So. I don't, I don't know. I don't know why you'd ever like commit to something being done. Yeah, I want to, I, I think that's right. I, I uh, align completely with that. And I, I think it too, um, it feels more true to real life, right? In a sense that everything is always in flux and moving and changing and nothing remains static. Um, you know, and I, I think where you run into problems sometimes is when you allow things to remain static or you, or you allow yourself to decide that something really is done. And like Jason said, there are instances where, you know, if a work sells or 
some, we give it away to someone. Yes. At that point it's out of our hands and it, you know, it's a, it, it, we no longer can mess with it, but I think so much of our, our, um, teaching and the way that we work and our research are all sort of folded together. There's just constant, constant flexibility, constant flux, constant change. Um, I mean, we're, we're learning new things constantly, daily, weekly. So all of those things have to filter into the work somehow. Thing is, I, I feel like we all have enough baggage and I think the idea of like your art practice being this additional sort of baggage just seems like an unnecessary thing. Like the idea that you're making, I mean, I like making things, right? And, and thinking about those things and talking about those things sometimes. Um, but I feel like, um, you know, the idea that like after you've made it, then you also have to be the like protector of it and the storer of it. And the like, I mean, that's like a burden that you're creating for yourself. And so if you, and I, I, part of this comes with age, I think, but like, you know, there was a time when I, I used, I, we come from printmaking backgrounds. I used to addition all my prints and I would have these drawers full of like tw additions of 20, 25, 30 things. And nobody even wanted them. Like, why was, I mean, it was good for practice and I got better at printing and I learned things that way. But I think like at, at some level, you have to look at what you're collecting and take responsibility for it or, or look at what you're making and take responsibility for it. So I mean, that sort of sounds kind of grandiose, but I, I do think like it's better to just keep things in flux. Gotcha. Yeah, I just, in response to hearing you talk about that, I'm curious how you guys think about sustainability because it sounds like there's a big amount of like recycling going on. And I don't know if that's just like inherent in the way that you work or if you're thinking about it in like, a, I guess, environmental way, but I'm just curious about how you think about being sustainable. I'll take that one. I, um, and I'm going to go back really far now. I'm going to go back to graduate school. Uh, so this is, you know, Jason and I have met each other at this point, but we are definitely not working together. Um, my thesis show was uh, a huge, massive amount of newsprint that was cut down into small squares to look like post-it notes. I mean, like bins and bins and bins of newsprint. And um, upon leaving graduate school and having to carry and tote that stuff around in like massive, you know, um, airtight Rubbermaid containers for a couple of years, I, it just, it made me, that along with like the hype of sustainability, you know, what would that, that would be 15, 16 years ago now, um, reading, you know, cradle to cradle, like kind of like it, it all was quickly dawned on me that like, oh my God, what am I making all of this stuff for? Where does it go? How does it live on? Why does it live on? What is the point? So I spent several years taking that one body of work and pulping it down and remaking paper and different pieces out of it over and over again, over and over again, until I could kind of just feel like, you know, it was done. And the last iteration actually of that paper ended up getting um, seeds planted in it and, and was a grow piece. And it like I, I spent the last living organic life of that paper as best I could. Um, so, you know, yeah, I think that's deep seated in what we do. I think I bring that to our collaboration. I think we talk about that a lot with the things that we make and, and um, the materials that we use and then how we repurpose and reuse them over and over again. Gotcha. Um, we have another question from Jackson. As artists who are very research focused, is communicating the idea behind the work more paramount, more paramount than what the final image is? Some people may interpret your work via the words and abstract idea that went into it, while others may respond to the graphic image alone. So like, what's the priority and how you're communicating what you want to communicate with your art? I mean, I don't know if there's a priority. I think that we have a practice that allows I, like, I think we both have a really hard time moving forward without a reason. So I think the research fuels that, right? The research like justifies various decisions. And you know, it's, it's like through a filter of our own aesthetics. I mean, I want things that like, to me, like I want it to look good. I want the, like the graphic quality of whatever we're doing to be engaging. And, um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think yeah, I think that's a, that's a real important, important thing to me. Um, but like that said, like whether or not people like get, go really deep into, I mean, we sort of said this in the talk, but I think like, you know, it's kind of a, on, 
on the viewer to like decide how far into anything that we do they want to go. Um, and you know, like one of the things we also said in the talk was about like how in the like creative research, like it can, it doesn't have to make complete sense and it doesn't have to be like, um, you know, beyond dispute or something. Like, I mean, we're in talking about color. I mean, it's, it's like a pretty like relative thing and it's a pretty, um, it's something that can be negotiated in a way, as opposed to like someone dealing with like climate science or something where it's like, you know, like a fact-based thing that can be proven. Um, so, I mean, I'm fine. If people like what we do, like I'm very happy regardless of the reason. So if it's just, they think something looks cool or looks good, like that's fine. Um, but if they're also really engaged with one of the ideas or they learn something or go somewhere with something that we talk about, like that's great too. Gotcha. Um, okay, we're nearing the end of our time. So if anybody has any last minute questions, you can feel free to ask them in the chat. Um, I think something that I was curious about, I think a lot of people get this question, like what's the craziest thing you've ever thought of? But um, I know that you apply to a lot of residencies and you apply to opportunities and you have to write proposals for those. Um, so I guess, is there ever, has there been an idea that was like too crazy or you haven't found the right residency yet to pursue? Like, is there any ever like a big disconnect in like the thing you wanna make and the ability to make it? That's a really interesting question too. I don't, I don't know if I have an answer to that. I mean, there's things that we still wanna do that we haven't been able to do. But of I course. Mean, I, think, um, I don't think it's ever been because of like like an idea that's, I mean, I wish we had ideas that were so like wild and off the wall that no one would even entertain them. Um, maybe that's what we should be shooting for. Um, but, you know, I think, I, so I'll just say like, and this, I don't know if this actually relates to your question, but I think because we um, have so much experience with academia, I think like one of the advantages of that is that we're both like reasonably capable at writing. And I think that's opened up a lot of doors. I mean, I feel like I, I definitely have had the experience with students who don't feel like um, writing is going to be all that important to what they do. And yet, like, uh, like the writing has opened at least as many doors as the actual. I mean, I, I don't know if, if the images aren't good, maybe it wouldn't help. But like, I think we've been able to pitch things to people that like, like we don't have proof that they exist, like, you know, that they exist or, or what they're going to be. But I think writing can really help sell something. And so, um, but yeah, I mean, I think uh, yeah, we've got like a kind of a short list of like things that we're hoping to someday do eventually. Maybe, I don't know if it's it's more like we're interested in the experience of going somewhere in particular or something. Um, I mean, that's guided a fair amount of like how we apply to things is sort of like where, where do we need to go? Um, but I don't know if it's ever been because of like the idea. I mean, I think we've, we've had a couple of pitches that have just been like, like, consistently rejected, even though I think they're good ideas. <laughs> but they're, you know, like if you don't do that, as long as we can do something, it's fine. I think too that like, um, I wanna couch the crazy in uh, this idea maybe that both Jason and I, I think are actually realists from for the most part too. I think a lot of what we approach, we approach from the standpoint of like, okay, we wanna get, we wanna get from here to here how do we get from here to here? And we do the research or we find the people or we network the way we need to network or get access to resources. Or, you know, for instance, we've been working at Dudene um, trying to figure out how to embed light in paper. And so we finally have figured out the right kind of uh, light that's like not LED, like, or that is LED, it's not, is it LED based? It's laser based. Anyway, it's like you do all of this research to finally get where you need to go. Um, but you, you don't do it alone. Like you do it with resources and, and with help from people and connections and your network and, um, you know, not being afraid to ask questions and ask for help and ask for advice. And I think that's gotten us really very far. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> we try very hard to be easy to work with. <laughs> it's, a, it's like an underrated uh, quality in artists, I think. Um, but I would recommend it to any of you starting your career. Be easy to work with. Yeah. And I'm going to piggyback on that and say that I remember um, a good friend of ours giving a talk, a designer, uh, several years ago at UT Austin. And 
part of his talk started off with just this notion of, you know, you're going to work with other people. You need to practice being kind. And it was like, yeah, man, you're right. You do need to practice being like it. And we don't say it often enough. We don't talk about it. And maybe we're talking about it more now in education because we're approaching our classrooms from a, a place that we've never had to approach them before. You know, it's a lot of education is about empathy right now. We're talking about how we are approaching one another in these extreme circumstances and how we're gonna work together to move through this, right? But I think practicing kindness is super important as makers, you know, and, and support and encouragement and empathy. Yeah, absolutely. I think that just extends beyond like the art world in general, just like as a person, it's nice to be nice to other people. <laughs> All right, it looks like we don't have any more questions. Um, so I'm gonna conclude the program for today. We're just nearing the end of our time. Uh, so once again, thank you everybody for attending this week's Visiting Artist Program Lecture with Jason and Leslie. We hope that you enjoyed today's lecture. Uh, we don't have a lecture next week, but there's one the week after. There's something else, perhaps a little bit important going on next week that we should pay attention to. So <laughs> that's my two cents. But anyway. Um, Especially those of you in Pennsylvania, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do it. Go vote. Do it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, thank you everybody for joining us and we look forward to seeing you soon. And thank you so much, Jason and Leslie. I thoroughly enjoyed that presentation. I think everybody loved that bibliography. Thank you. Thank you so much.